Thank you, Peter. There's uh, quite a bit of glitter on your jacket. <laughs> you never know what the media is going to do with something like that. <laughs> so get Marini to just help you dust it off. That's good. <laughs> Congressman. Congressman DeFazio. And Marini Dowd, thank you for joining us. And my fellow residents and citizens of the 4th Congressional District of the State of Oregon, thank you for making time for this event and for your contributions to Mr. DeFazio's campaign. I hope as this evening unfolds, you will consider this gathering in support of Mr. DeFazio time well spent. And I hope you will bear with me for a few minutes while I try to make clear why I thought it would be a good idea to get together. I'm a writer, someone with no background in politics, no expertise in policy, and to be plain, I'm not a political activist in any formal way. That kind of bravery, when it <clears throat> comes to the defense and elucidation of the principles of governance I believe in, is not within my gift. I write and I worry about my country and its people and try to offer, in some of what I write, explicit observations and insights that I hope will help other men and women do their own work well. In the context of this evening, that means I am hoping to offer some useful thought about citizenship, if you'll let me use that somewhat antiquated term. At a time when the integrity of the country and the safety of its people are threatened in myriad ways by desperate partisan thought, willful ignorance, and the pathologies of self-aggrandizement. And at a time when tens of millions of us scattered from here to the far coasts are poised to make choices we believe will ensure a better or at least a less menacing future by our selecting one man or one woman over another to represent us. So let me begin there. Who is it who represents us? And what thinking brings us to make the choices on our ballots that we do? In the spring of 1969, a play called 1776, a musical actually, opened in what is now called the Richard Rogers Theater on West 46th Street in New York. The play is about events leading up to the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and it was written and produced as a musical in part to keep the momentous decisions of those days from seeming too grave or solemn. The play was nominated for five Tony Awards and won three, including Best Musical. In 1972, it was made into a movie. In trying to put my notes together for this evening, I was reminded of 1776 because a striking moment in that play for me came when one of the characters, it might have been John Adams, raised a question about how the citizenry should approach the election of a congressional representative. Adams, if, if it was Adams, framed his question this way. Do you vote for someone because their position on matters of policy and affairs of state closely matches your own? Or do you vote for someone you trust to make good decisions because of their integrity and conscientious work? even if you yourself are likely to be at odds with some of those decisions. You can, I suppose, make a persuasive argument for the former, but I don't know what that would be. Like the playwright Sherman Edwards, I lean toward electing someone I trust to make good decisions for me, someone whose ideals I subscribe to, but who is not undone as I would be and rendered ineffective by the ethical offensiveness of actually forging policy with people they don't respect. If I can believe a candidate who seeks my vote has no duplicity in them, that their words can be trusted, given the usual measure of distortion we're all accustomed to in political gamesmanship, then I will take a chance and say to the candidate, you have my vote. I ask you as my representative 
to remember to place the livelihood and well-being of myself and other citizens first ahead of the livelihood of institutions, of corporations and ideologies. I ask you to vote your conscience, to be diligent with your homework, and to be most attentive to those who have no financial stake in how you vote. And I ask you to be courteous but firm when lobbyists come with gifts or with bills they have saved you the trouble of drafting yourself. And if you vote contrary to what my instincts tell me is right, I will trust your integrity and intelligence to such a degree that I will seek to find out why I am wrong before telling you that you're wrong. To go the other way here, to vote instead for someone whose pronouncements and speeches as a candidate seem to match your own philosophy of law and governance at every turn, runs the risk, it seems to me, of encouraging candidates generally to misrepresent themselves in order to garner votes, to appear to be what they are not in order to get elected. In the worst cases, candidates simply lie to their constituents and develop the habit of being sincerely insincere, indifferent to your fate, but desirous of your support. Further, the candidate seeking to project himself as an ideal candidate before every audience he encounters soon has no idea at all of what he actually means as a human being. He is, at this point, a representative who attracts the attention of special interest groups. He becomes the embodiment of what George Orwell warned us about in 1984, representatives who believe in the primacy of the estate, the primacy of the state, and the authority of wealth not the primacy of the citizen. Such an elected representative becomes over time instead the paid representative <clears throat> of those in power. To stay in power, these people need the vote of the representative, and the vote of the representative maintains the illusion of a republic, and in our case, a democracy. So if you were to ask me one more citizen in this room this evening, to, re to respond to John Adams' question, I would say vote for someone with a record of consistent integrity, someone who doesn't have to be supervised or reprimanded, someone not driven by anger, someone who won't tell you that it is possible to reform humanity or government with a simple change in personnel or a vigorous campaign of enforcement of one sort or another. When the country's situation is grim, as it is for us now, imagine for a moment any of a dozen major environmental and financial issues in the news this evening, we have an understandable tendency to reflect on the origins of our country, to ask what has gone wrong, and to fall into the belief, because it is seductive, that the Founding Fathers had most everything figured out, and that we should appeal to their wisdom in our time of confusion and anxiety. But they did not have everything figured out. They could not, at the time, speak to such issues as nuclear disarmament, stem cell research, or the collapse of natural ecosystems. What they did have, and what I saw on that stage in Manhattan 41 years ago, was an intuition about their own fallibility, an awareness that democracy was not a mechanism, like a car which needs a tune-up now and then, but a process. Democracy, they knew, was an experiment, one that incorporated founding principles like justice and freedom, but which sought to keep pace with the evolution of society in all its unanticipated complexity. Their hope, I believe, was that the citizenry, through its representatives, would, for example, shape society's institu emerging institutions, that it would not be the other way around. In short, they would have been appalled by the regal arrogance of modern corporations, the insouciance with which corporations pursue strategies for profit, for example, and remain indifferent to human pain. Given the juncture we're at in the year 2010, whether you live in the United States of America, or in a hovel in Bangkok, or in a concrete high-rise in Caracas, you have to be wondering what has become of the ideal of the conscientious representative. 
person of selfless integrity of the sort idealized in our nation's history. I say this tonight prompted by the interviews I conducted with young people from a dozen Asian, South American, and European countries during an international conference on global healing held in Bali a few years ago at which Desmond Tutu spoke and Fatima Galani, the director of Red Crescent in Afghanistan, and at which I also spoke. Also on interviews more recently in Beirut with young people, Druze, Shia, Sunni, Christian, Lebanese and Palestinian refugees who had virtually given up on the ideals of political representation we, many of us in America, remain hopeful about. But what really do we find in the very disturbing landscape of the off-year elections of 2010 in our country? Let me be discomfortingly blunt here, and if you think I exaggerate, I apologize for my impoliteness. My effort is to break through some sort of pasteboard wall and say, given that our physical, our spiritual, and our mental lives are increasingly at risk here, that we cannot afford the pandering to appeals, the pandering appeals to fear, the instigations of anger, and the unethical courtship of the poorly informed that have emerged with such an edge recently in American electoral politics. This isn't the path to a solution to our predicament, and it is clearly the road leading away from wisdom. If we do not do something about this, our children and our grandchildren will not simply take us for fools, they will regard us as betrayers, as people who let the ideals of equity, civility, charity, justice, and reverence slip away while they became more embroiled in distraction and in placating the human appetites that the neurosis of consumerism, like some beast, feeds upon. That group of men who gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of 1776 had much on their minds besides independence, of course. Ideas that would not mature, some of them, until the Constitution was drafted in 1787. Already in nation form, however, was the notion of a system of checks and balances in the design of the federal government. And forgive me here if what I'm about to say seems obvious or naive. In European forms of governance, these men knew, trouble for the citizenry came from three directions. The unilateral power of the king to do as he pleased, the freedom of the friends and associates of the king to arrange commerce and the countryside in general as they saw fit, principally to ensure the continuance of the privileges and wealth attendant on owning land and the often unilateral power of judges, the police, and other administers of the law in deciding guilt or innocence arbitrarily. It was the fear that one or another of these three potentially tyrannical sources of power would compromise the freedoms articulated in the Constitution that led, if I've not misread this chapter in our history, to the establishment of a system of checks and balances designed to preclude any unilateral action by the executive, the legislative, or the judicial branches of government. What no one at the time saw coming, but which was soon to be evident with the rise of capitalism and the disintegration of slave-based economies early in the 19th century, was the emergence of a fourth source of a potential threat to the citizenry. The organization of the forcing pressure of money and commerce on an unprecedented scale spurred by the Industrial Revolution. 